The Supreme Personality of God had said, It is lost only Arjuna which is born of contact with the material mode of passion and later transformed into wrath, and which is the all-devouring sinful enemy of this world. Report, when a living entity comes in contact with the material creation, his eternal love for Krishna is transformed into lust in association with the mode of passion. Or in other words, the sense of love of God becomes transformed into lust, as milk in contact with sour tamarind is transformed into yogurt. That uh, example probably wouldn't fly much in America. You don't use tamarind to make yogurt in America, is it? Even in India also, it's mainly made by adding a little yogurt to milk, the way it can be made by adding tamarind, sour tamarind, ripe tamarind. Mm. Then again, when lust is unsatisfied, it turns into wrath. Wrath is transformed into illusion, and illusion continues the material existence. Therefore, lust is the greatest enemy of the living entity, and it is lust only which induces the pure living entity to remain entangled in the material world. Wrath is the manifestation of the mode of ignorance. These modes exhibit themselves as wrath and other corollaries. If, therefore, the mode of passion, instead of being degraded into the mode of good, uh, mode of ignorance, is elevated to the mode of goodness by the prescribed method of living and acting, then one can be saved from the degradation of wrath by spiritual attachment. The Supreme Personality of Godhead expanded himself into many for his ever-increasing spiritual bliss. <clears throat> and the living entities are parts and parcels of this spiritual bliss. They also have partial independence, but by misuse of their independence. When the service attitude is transformed into the propensity for sense enjoyment, they come under the sway of lust. This material creation is created by the Lord to give facility to the conditioned souls to fulfill these lustful propensities. And when completely baffled by prolonged lustful activities, the living entities begin to inquire about their real position. This inquiry is the beginning of the Vedanta Sutras, wherein it is said, Atato Brahma Jignasa. One should inquire into the Supreme, and the Supreme is defined in Srimad Bhagavatam as Janmadhyasya Yaton Vyad Itaratascha, or the origin of everything is the Supreme Brahman. Therefore, the origin of lust is also in the Supreme. 
If therefore lust is transformed into love for the Supreme or transformed into Krishna consciousness, or in other words, desiring everything for Krishna, then both, both lust and wrath can be spiritualized. Hanuman, the great servitor of Lord Rama, exhibited his wrath by burning the golden city of Ravana, but by doing so, he became the greatest devotee of the Lord. Here also in Bhagavad Gita, the Lord induces Arjuna to engage his wrath upon his enemies for the satisfaction of the Lord. Therefore, lust and wrath, when they are employed in Krishna consciousness, become our friends instead of enemies. The great enemy is desire. Karma means desire, uh, particularly means lustful, sexual desire, or that may refer to any desire. <clears throat> it is described here as the great, uh, the all devouring enemy. And it goes along with anger. And these are just yeah, these are described as the great enemies. And uh, Srila Prabhupada describes why by paraphrasing uh, a section from the previous chapter, how uh, by desire or how desire arises by uh, meditating on the sense objects. Last night we discussed this Vishayendriya Samyogam, the joining of the senses with the sense objects. So the first one, uh, if one thinks about the sense objects, then one will desire to enjoy them. That is the general tendency within this material world. Uh, therefore, many transcendentalists, they try to physically place themselves in such a situation where they're not beset by sense objects. Uh, they may go to the forest or a cave away from the rush of, uh, and the, the, of the interaction of human society uh, and live a very austere life for the purpose of uh, becoming self-realized, understanding that material attraction, when that arises within the heart, that will distract one from attaining self-realization, whether that self-realization is conceived of as becoming liberated from this material world, uh, to uh, whether it's conceived of as merging into some impersonal uh, light, or whether it's conceived of as uh, entering the spiritual world, the kingdom of God, it is understood by all transcendentalists that material desire militates against becoming spiritually realized and therefore they try to separate themselves from it. It is the great enemy of the living being. Uh, lust and then anger. Krodh means anger. This may take various forms apart from the kind of anger where someone loses his temper and becomes violent or shouts. Uh, anger can be suppressed within also, uh, in which case it may manifest, it may suddenly manifest sudden anger uh, of, of someone who's repressing that desire and then suddenly loses control of it altogether. Or it could manifest as uh, frustration or even depression. Uh, depression that one is 
frustrated that I could not fulfill my desires. Therefore, I feel unhappy. I, the world is not the way I want it to be. Uh, most of these uh, mental diseases, uh, they are all transformations of lust, unfulfilled desire, because people cultivate material desires and they become disappointed. Even if the desires are fulfilled, still we feel disappointed because we don't achieve the happiness that we expected to get from it. And uh, the foolish materialist, even though his desire isn't fulfilled, he thinks, well, I have to do something, and maybe it's something else. And they're always thinking of the next thing to do, which they think will make them happy. But it doesn't make them happy. And so this chasing after the will of the wisp is the example given. The will of the wisp. In the modern cities, you won't know what that is. Uh, it's uh, like a glow worm which you see in the dark. And all these examples which are given, they're all outdated now. We have to have other ones. I have to think up some other ones. Uh, outdated in the sense that people live in cities and you don't see the will o' the wisp. Glow worm, because there's a little, tiny little flashing light. It doesn't give much light. So if you go searching after it, it'll be very difficult to find. And even if you get it, if you think I'll get some light from that, even if you get it, it's not enough light to do anything. You can't, you can't do anything. It's, it's a tiny little thing. Have you seen? In the, yeah. In the fields, yeah. What do you call them here? Glowworm, maybe? In English, that's a. Uh, Kadyot in Sanskrit. Kadyot. Yeah, uh, or you know, fire, firefly. Firefly. Lightning bug. Lightning bug. Lightning bug, you're flying. Fireflies. Mm. Okay. So, uh, even if you manage to get it, 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 what use is it to you? Unless you're some kind of entomologist who takes <laughs> takes pleasure in finding little bugs and studying them. So, uh, lust transforms into wrath. Srila Prabhupada uses this uh, somewhat archaic English word in this connection. Uh, and Krishna describes it as the great enemy. But toward the end of the purport, Srila Prabhupada suggests how it cannot be, how anger can be not an enemy, but it can be spiritualized. And in fact, this verse is spoken by Krishna in Bhagavad Gita, in which he's inciting Arjuna to fight, for which anger is required to fight against enemies. <clears throat> So, lust and wrath, although they're described here as being the enemy of the conditioned soul, all devouring, that means it eats, eats up all our spiritual aspirations, or practically the, uh, the spiritual aspirations, even before they have a chance to develop, to manifest in a, in a highly materialistic culture, the spirit, spiritual aspiration, the natural faith which a child can easily develop in God, it doesn't develop at all because even before they can walk and talk, they're being bombarded by uh, advertisements and the, the culture just trains them to be foolish materialists, searching after that which cannot be had, which is happiness via sense enjoyment. <clears throat> but although this material desire and anger, they're enemies because they, they direct our attention away from our real need, 
which is to be Krishna conscious. Uh, they they can be good because desire in and, in and of itself is not bad. Desire, if directed toward the service of Krishna, that is the perfection of life. There are some transcendentalists who think that to simply stop all desire, that is the perfection. They see that desire leads to entanglement in repeated birth and death. Therefore, they say to stop all desire. Chitta vritti nirodha, that's the definition of yoga. Uh, to stop the ah, vrittis, the, the mental transformations within the consciousness, just to stop it. But from Bhagavad Gita we understand that that can't actually be done because the very nature of the living being is to be conscious. And consciousness means consciousness of something. Of course, the yogis in the Patanjala, Patanjala yogis, they will say, no, in the perfect state you're just conscious, that's all. There's nothing to be conscious of, but you're just conscious. Or you are consciousness. Uh, but the Vedanta school, of which we are followers, says, no, conscious means there's, there is the observer and the observed. So Krishna is the object of consciousness, the proper object of consciousness. Therefore we say Krishna consciousness. To be conscious of Krishna, which means to be conscious of our relationship with him. So to desire for Krishna that is pure consciousness. And anger may manifest also in Krishna consciousness. Pure uh, anger means to be angry for the sake of serving Krishna. So that anger for the sake of serving Krishna is much better than uh, simply being mild. When anger is called for, which is not always, not all the time. Just It's not that if someone puts some tilak on his face and he has a license to go, <laughs> to go out and uh, be a serial killer. Uh, or even to, much more mildly, to insult others verbally. Uh, but anger arises when, when, when one sees that, when a devotee sees that, Someone is acting in a manner that is detrimental to, seriously detrimental to their own good or particularly their uh, being uh, obnoxious toward devotees. Uh, or to, Hanuman is mentioned here that uh, Ravana had seriously insulted Lord Rama and therefore Hanuman became angry. So we see here that uh, although Arjuna just wanted to be a nice guy, but Krishna told him, don't be a nice guy. <laughs> uh, don't be nice according to the estimation of materialists. This is, I chose this because I'm continuing the subject which I didn't finish speaking on last night that to be nice in the estimation of the materialists means to uh, uh, act in a manner which they consider to be conducive for their sense gratification. And it may not be gross sense gratification. It can be uh, mild or even apparently very good sense, sense gratification. For instance, uh, there is, at the present time, a rising vegan movement with the idea that we should be nice to the animals and we shouldn't kill them, we shouldn't even take the milk from the cows, we should only take vegetables and fruits and nuts and items like that. And in this way we'll all live happily 
so it's an idea. We'll all be good in the world and be nice to everyone. Uh, this is, although they don't know it, it's an, another expression of envy toward Krishna, because Krishna likes milk. Uh, he's famous as Gopal, so. Milk should be offered to Krishna. So that's one defect of the vegan movement. Another defect is the whole idea of being nice and happy in this material world. It's all based on this, the same idea uh, of enjoying the senses. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's not as horrific and gross as the uh, slaughterhouse killing of animals. But it's, it's a milder form, more gentle form of sense gratification to think that we'll only eat vegetables. But it's still misleading and it still has the same effect that although it might seem very good in the beginning, ultimately it results in misery. Because simply by uh, taking vegetables, one cannot be elevated to the transcendental platform. One could become a mm, herbivore animal in the next life. Uh, if one is, if one, one's main goal in life is to uh, only take vegetable foods. Of course, many herbivores like cows, they also take milk at the beginning of their life, at least. Even humans do. What do the vegans do to their children when they have children? They don't feed them breast milk? They do. They do. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's allowed. And when they're weaned, that's it. That's it forever. No more animal-based foods. <clears throat> So this idea, what the, the defect of it, all things that may say, you, you were asking also about this being nice to others on the material platform, uh, be nice, smile at them. Uh, that also has the effect of, it seems good in the beginning, but in the end it turns to poison because that's the nature of this material world. It's avoiding Krishna. Not only do we have the duty to be uh, not to harm others. Mahinsyat sarva bhutanam. Don't. That's uh, one injunction to not be violent or, or envious of others. That's one injunction. Okay, that's good, but then the positive thing is that we have to satisfy Krishna. Simply to be non-violent to others, that's ignoring Krishna, which means it binds us in this material world. And there's, there's a, a very real danger also in this idea of just being nice. That uh, live and let live. Whisper words of wisdom, let it be. You know that song? Yeah. You know that? We all know that Yeah. I thought the younger ones might not know it. Yeah. Words of wisdom, let it be. Let the slaughterhouse be. Let the uh, munitions and armaments in industry be. Let it all continue. As long as. I'll smile at you, you smile at me, and then uh, I, you go off to work and you kill 500 cows a day. And Ah, okay. As long as you smile at me and you wave and say, Hello, good morning, have a good day, have a great day in America. <laughs> in England it's a good day, in America it's a great day. Uh, as long as you do that, then it's okay, everything's okay. And as long as the slaughterhouse is outside the city and we can't hear it, see it, hear it, or smell it, then it's okay. But it's not okay. I'm okay, you're okay. Who said? Anyone can say it, but 
who is the one who decides what's okay and what's not okay? That is Krishna. He tells what is right and what is wrong. So we should know. Tasmat chastram pramanam te kaya kaya vanaspito. Gyatva shastra vidhano tam kayam karma iharasi. One should know what one is supposed to do in this world and what one is not supposed to do by understanding, by knowing, by knowing. It is one's duty to know what one is supposed to do and not supposed to do according to the injunctions of Shastra, Scripture, which are given by God. There is a law maker, however much we may wish to deny the law maker. The scientists are so busy studying the laws of the universe and no law maker. That's there. Uh, it's almost incredible foolishness how they can imagine that there are laws without a law maker. Why do they think like that? Why? How can they think there's, there's laws without a law maker? Why is that? It's, it's not a scientific position. It's not even a philosophical position. It's just born out of their envy of the Supreme Lord. And therefore their intelligence becomes clouded. And they think like that. Otherwise, even a little child can understand that there's a lawmaker. And the big PhDs, they, they, uh, they make big, big theories to try to disprove what even a little child can understand. It's a matter of attitude. So the attitude, I'm okay, you're okay, everyone do whatever they like, that might seem to be very nice. But, uh, if that is in denial of God, then it's a form of atheism. And uh, the idea, will, I, will, I'll be happy in this world, you'll be happy in this world. We don't need any God. Imagine a world, here we are, the other kind of Shastra, now, another, another Vito classic, Lenin. Imagine a world in which there's no religion, John Lennon said, how we can all live peacefully. And uh, he found out that practically his theory didn't work when one person walked up to him one day and shot him dead. All these people who talk about peace, usually they end up like that, isn't it? Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, John Lennon. It's ironic that they speak of peace and tolerance and someone shoots them dead. As if to prove that the, the whole idea of making this world into an ideal place is itself a major mistake. The whole idea that we shall live here peacefully and happily, it's a mistake. Because this world is the jail. <laughs> you know, we're here because of forgetfulness of God, of Krishna. So, uh, it can be nice if we all remember Krishna. And then it won't be a jail anymore. Then it will be the spiritual world. But if we forget that, then uh, all attempts to be nice and good and happy and at the same time remain criminals, it's not going to work because there's a big police squad which sees everything we do without having cameras everywhere. <laughs> In Detroit, I guess there are cameras all over the place, is it? In England, wherever you go, there are cameras everywhere. Wherever you are in a city, you're being watched at every moment. But, uh, somewhere downtown. In they the downtown. They broke the law completely like that. Well, they're supposed to. Yeah. Only really downtown. There's yeah. The rest of the city, kill whoever you want, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, that's the mistake. <laughs> God has his camera. Sarvata pani padam tat sarvato kshit. His eyes are everywhere. His hands, legs. His eyes are everywhere. And he has his agents. So this idea that we shall live very peacefully in this world and remain criminals. Srila Prabhupada gave this example that the uh, criminals, they, to, a gang, they do a robbery. 
And then afterwards they say, now we should divide the loot morally. <laughs> See? I did, I did the main job. I was the main, what do you call that? Gunman? Or, there's a word for it. Hitman. Yeah. Hitman. I did the main job, so I deserve 50% for myself. And you others were just watching out. So you divide the rest. That's moral. So, no, 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 no. We all took the same risk. Uh, then they discuss among themselves. They have a moral discussion about the, the way to divide the loot. But they're criminals. So the whole idea of being moral and remaining a criminal is uh, absurd. So in the same way, the whole idea of being good in this world without God, it's absurd. Even though uh, the atheists, they claim, you, know, you can be good, we can, we can make up our morality without recourse to any religious mumbo-jumbo, as they call it. But what is this idea of being good? What, what does it mean to be good? Where does the concept of good come from? Good and bad. What does it mean? If we're all just chemicals, then what does it matter? Chemicals... There's no good or bad in chemicals. If you mix acid with alkali, is that good or bad? It's not good or bad. It just happens. So according to their theory, everything is just chemicals or, or energies. So where's the good and the bad? It's just, there's no basis for it. The very discussion of good and bad means that there is a uh, judge of what is good and the, of good and bad that there it, it is something that is metaphysical it's not just something to do with uh, chemical beyond chemical there's no good and bad for chemicals mm. But even the uh, atheists, they, have a, they, they, they won't agree that, well, it's all the same whether someone lives or dies. No, they, they recognize the difference between uh, if someone comes with an axe and, and wrecks a car, it's a crime. But even the atheists will recognize that if you come with an axe and kill a, a human, that's much worse than killing a car. And you'll get, you'll get more of a jail sentence or more of a punishment. For even though the, uh, in terms of chemical composition, the car is more valuable than the human body. You can't sell a human body for scrap. Or maybe you can, actually, to people. Kidneys, heart, all this kind of thing. Oh, shouldn't advertise that too much. <laughs> Could be a good business. Macabre business. Uh, but the chemicals themselves, they have no value. Okay, I got a garland. You're just waiting to see whether you like the class or not. <laughs> Seven out of ten. <laughs> yeah, we're laughing, but it's actually very, it's a very serious subject matter, isn't it? The, the whole society has got, they say good and bad, they never, they never think what is really good and bad. How is anything good or bad? What is the basis of it all? Why do we put more value on a human life than, than a car? Why, why, why? <coughs> Even if they do discuss it, they'll get, they'll get lost in some theoretical philosophy. But the answer is very simple. There is God. We are all parts of God. Not that we are God. We are parts of God and servants of God. We are meant for serving Him.
And if we don't, we suffer. If we do, we're happy. If we don't, we suffer. Not that God is uh, envious of us. But it's the, by our very nature, we can be happy in service to Krishna. And if we don't do that, then by nature we become unhappy. And if we don't serve him out of a uh, sense of envy, then that envy spreads to other living beings. So actually we can't be good without recognizing our position in relationship to God. So the whole idea of being good and nice without relationship to God, it is only, uh, it's superficial. So Krishna, in here in Bhagavad Gita, he induces Arjuna to fight. He doesn't promote insubstantial good feelings that you might get by telling someone, have a great day. And they know when you say that, that you don't mean it. I mean, they don't even, no one even thinks. It's, you might as well say, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Isn't it? No one, if you're, you go in the shop and they say, have a, as you can say, blah, 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 then they might take notice. But if, if you say, have a great day, you're not even listening. Because you know, it's, there's nothing behind it. It's, it's just a ritual. Just like at the end of the class, it's become a ritual to say, thank you, Maharaj, for the wonderful class. <laughs> It's a ritual. It's become a ritual. Okay, it's, you may say it's a nice ritual, but a ritual it is. <clears throat> so Krishna, he doesn't promote insubstantial good feelings. He promotes what is actually good. The attempt to have good feelings without being good is a kind of deception. It's not going to work. Uh, to be actually good requires a change of consciousness. To be actually good requires that we understand what it means to be good. Simply to be a good citizen and mow your lawn once every, how often? Two or three weeks. Pay your taxes. Don't shoot others dead. Maybe some deer in, in Michigan, that's a popular spot, huh? hunting. Uh, and then you can be good. But Krishna re induces Arjuna, although he's very reluctant to do so, Krishna induces Arjuna to kill. And Arjuna knows that in doing so, and that's, that's one reason why Arjuna is reluctant to kill, that this will call much, cause much lamentation, not among those who are killed, because they're, they're, they're real soldiers, they have the real martial spirit. They're there to, to, to win or to die. That is the Kshatriya spirit. But their wives and relatives, they will <clears throat> lament. Which means that there's also good feeling among the demons. When Karna was slain, Duryodhana lamented. He was unhappy. They were accomplices in grossly sinful activities. But they had affection for each other. So there's good feeling even among the demons, persons who are against Krishna consciousness. They may have good feelings, but their good feeling is on the basis of joint badness. So Krishna, he tells Arjuna, you should kill. These people are, are such a disturbance in the world that there can be no sense of God consciousness in society as long as they're in charge. So that good feeling without a sense of God consciousness, that is our enemy. Krishna says here that the lust, lust and anger, 
which also means uh, usually often, often we speak about last karma in this section of Bhagavad Gita Krishna speaks about karma in this particular verse he speaks about krodha, anger and often they're put together with the others kam, krod, lo, moha, madha, matsarya which pretty much every Hindu up until the last generation they knew these words isn't it? the young ones they don't know they don't know anything they know how to play around on their phones and you know nothing. Did you know that when you grew up? Kam krod lo moha madha matsarya? You mm-hmm. heard it. No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm looking at Goranga Prasad who grew up in a normal Hindu, not very religious family. Is that right? Yeah, Sindhi means... No, yeah, not any Sindhi, anyone. They're not very religious. Did your father do anything in the home, puja? Any pictures of some gods? Any altar? The mother kept him out. Yeah. Father, now by your interest, he's becoming interested somewhat. So, yeah, everyone used to know. Kankro, Loba, Mohammed, Matsai. The six enemies. Uh, that's lust, desire. Sorry, lust is desire. Anger, greed. Kankrod, Loba, Moha, illusion, Mada, pride, and Matsarya, envy, or unwarranted bad feelings towards others. For no particular reason. You just, just when you, when you see someone, you don't like them. That's all. I mean, and, and that can extend to the whole human race, including yourself. Very unfortunate condition. These are the enemies. These mental states are our enemies. But so we may think that, yeah, it's not good to feel badly about others. So we should feel good about them. But this insubstantial good feeling, which is not based on the substance of knowledge of God, recognition of our subordination to Him, that is also our enemy. Because it's predicated on. Uh, Mm. Envy of Krishna, avoidance of Krishna. Uh, that's why we see, uh, well, that saying is that absolute power corrupt. Someone is good, they get power, they become bad. That means actually in their heart they weren't good. Because if someone is actually good, if he's not thinking to exploit others, then he won't become corrupted by power. What does it mean that absolute power corrupts? Power corrupt? That means that you're good as long as you don't have the opportunity to exploit others. And it means actually you want to. If you had the opportunity, you would. But in the, op- in the situation where everyone's all more or less on the same level, you find it more expeditious to be nice and good because it serves your own purpose better. But then if you don't have to be nice and good to others, you can just... Uh, force them to do what you want, and then we'll see who is good. Power corrupts. But it doesn't power doesn't corrupt someone who has no motivation to exploit others. And that will come if one is in Krishna consciousness. One is fully satisfied, simply serving Krishna. And he doesn't desire anything in this material world, doesn't doesn't see others as competitors in the uh, endeavor to grab things and enjoy them, uh, he's fully satisfied in his heart. It's a very high level of consciousness, but it is quite possible for everyone to attain because it is our natural consciousness, Krishna consciousness. Uh, so even being nice, without a sense of God consciousness. It's, we can say at best it's inadequate. It's, it's in, inadequate. And it won't actually help us or anyone else. Without knowledge of who is 
God. What is our relationship with Him? How to act in that relationship? Everything else we try to do to be good will be at best insufficient and insubstantial. Therefore, to be good, first we have to be a devotee of Krishna. And then being good will automatically come. Yasyasti bhakti bhagavatya kinchana saralaya gunais tatra samasate sura. No, this does? No? You're nodding your head as if in affirmation. Actually, you should know this verse. It's, uh, if we listen to Srila Prabhupada's lectures, we'll see he quotes this verse many times. I just. Oh, you didn't know because it was. It was Prayers of Prahlad in the fifth canto. It's one of uh, we were just listening to. So he says that for one who has his yasti bhakti, who has devotion to the supreme Lord, without desiring anything else, within such a person, all godly qualities are present. But harab abhaktasya kuto mahan guna mano mano ratena asati dhavato. But in one who is not a devotee of Hari, Krishna, God, Bhagavan, uh, it's put as a question, rhetorical question. Where are the great qualities? Someone may have good qualities. But they're not really great qualities because they're on the external platform. They, they're not from the soul. It's some mental adjustment. Which means it can change also. Uh, the good person gets power, becomes a bad person. Or even one may be a good person in the eyes of society in this life. But then in the next life, it may become by the different association, one becomes a bad person. So really the <coughs> the point is that to actually bring good into our life and into the world, we should first of all know what is good. Good Goodness, yeah, that is the quality of God. In relation to Him, we can be good. Without that relationship, uh, this, the so-called goodness will be insufficient, insubstantial, transient, and uh, in this way won't actually help us. It's good that people are thinking of being good. It's better than thinking of being bad. But really we must know what it means to be good. Causing pain to others how can that be good? Others means not only humans feel pain, but animals feel pain. So society that as a regular function tortures throughout their lives literally millions of living beings and then kills them. Does no one think? They don't think. They don't think. Well, we're talking about the vegans. They're thinking about it. That's good. They're thinking about it. And they're doing something also, stopping to take food from animals. But that's still incomplete, because it's devoid of a sense of Krishna consciousness, God consciousness. Is there any question about this, please, or comment? Yeah. There's two competing forces of morality in the world. One is divine and revelatory. The other mm -hmm. is secular and humanistic. And in our Yeah, I read your letter, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in our sacred societies, it seems now that in the name of niceness and political correctness uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. that they're coming under under the influence, whether it's Christianity or Vaishnavism, yeah, yeah. of secular morality. And so where is the line of demarcation? Very good point. Very, very good point. Uh, between enabling, between enabling 
immoral behavior? Where is the line where we are Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat that so that it gets recorded here. Uh, two approaches to morality. One is revelatory, coming from God, from Scripture. And another is secular, humanistic, where there's no... Uh, uh, they feel that there's no need to recognize any God, but just among ourselves we can work out his good morals. So, what was the question again exactly? Where, where does the line... Where, where is we, the line of demarcation when we're working within our own society? When we, oh, right, and you said that the, 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 the God-centered morality tradition, or I, I would say theistic traditions in which morality is uh, an important manifestation of the whole culture. It's not that in the theistic traditions the main thing is to be moral, but it's an automatic corollary of being theistic. Whereas secular humanists by very definition, they don't believe in God, although they may say it's okay for you to believe in God, and some of them say it's not okay for you to believe in God. So they may have a discussion about that among themselves. But they say uh, you don't need God to be moral, and that those and, and the kind of uh, morality that they promote and behavioral standards that they promote is influencing the theistic traditions. So, where, where is the line that we in the theistic traditions have to draw between accepting their kind of morality and being reduced to total immorality? Is that the right? Did, right. I, yeah, did right. I phrase you properly? <laughs> Well, I think any, anyone in any theistic tradition who's committed to that will, will say that, that, that the laws of God are morality. Dharmaṁ tu sākṣad bhagavat pranītam. Dharma. This is a complex uh, concept which is not known in the Western world. It's, it's translated as religion, but it actually means a lot more than the word religion. Uh, connotes and connotates in the uh, English language. So that is given by God. Uh, I quoted one verse from Bhagavad Gita during this talk. Ya Shastra Vidhi Mutsrija Vartate Kama Karata Nasa Siddhima Bhagavati Nasukam Naparangati. Actually, I didn't quote that verse, I quoted the next verse. Yes, Tasma, Tasma Chastram Pramanante Kaya Kaya Vyavastita Gyatva Shastra Vidhanantam Kāyam kāna iharat, iharasi. The first verse is that uh, those who give up scriptural injunctions and act according to their own whims, they can attain neither happiness nor perfection nor the supreme destination. Therefore, uh, much, one should act according to scriptural injunctions, knowing one should know them also. One should know them and act them and act according to them in this world. Um, that's a simple guideline. It does become very complex because life in this world is very complex and scriptural injunctions, they give guidelines but they can't cover every circumstance. And... Um, the whole Mahabharata especially, in which Bhagavad Gita is a very, very small part. The whole Mahabharata, I was just talking about this on Sunday. Uh, the whole Mahabharata is, is full of situations in which people come to a situation which is called Dharma Sankhat, which means a, uh, a religious dilemma. The whole Bhagavad Gita came out of this, that Arjuna thought, if I fight, I will do wrong. By killing so many people, 
going against my gurus. But if I don't fight, I'll also do wrong. Because uh, I'm duty-bound as a religiously trained warrior to protect society from people like those I'm supposed to fight. One of my gurus is my elder brother on whose behalf I'm supposed to fight. So he couldn't see, I, it was a lose-lose situation for him to use Kaviistic language. Uh, is Kavi still, still big? Fade away. They come and go, these people, don't they? It's like some fashion. It was huge in Iskon at one time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But they actually died. Oh, I didn't even know he died. Well, it happens to everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have to be out there stumping away. And then, then people say, here, stop making that noise. He didn't hear at all. He's absorbed. Enough. Okay, very good. Uh, so, yeah, the whole Mahabharata is full of this. What do you do when one scriptural injunction tells you to do one thing and another one tells you to do something else? What do you do in situation? You consult your guru who can tell you. If your guru is not there, well, you should take training. Every human being should take training in understanding what is dharma, what, what should be done and what is not to be done. Even then, it may be very difficult to understand in some circumstances. What should we do in such a circumstance? Because the, the unique situation... One thing is, we can't, we can't be aware of all the descriptions which have been given in Scripture about various dilemmas and how various persons face them. Uh, and even if we were, there may be new situations that arise. That's the material world. So, uh, in such a situation, we may have to do what we think is best, but we might be wrong. And in this regard, there's a story which I often tell, which I told on Sunday in Zurich also, on this same point. It's a, it's a, Krishna told this to Arjuna. It's a story within a story, but to make it short, I'll just tell the story within the story and not the bigger story, which is within a bigger story. Uh, there was a, a, a pious Brahmin, or at least he thought he was pious, who made a vow, I will never tell an untruth in my life. Brahmin should always speak the truth. Kshatriyas may be not. Vaishyas may be not. Shudras, you expect them to lie. <laughs> and there's, no, there's not much sin attached to that because their, their level, they're not expected to be on such a high level of consciousness. So he made a vow never to tell a lie in his life. He lived at the edge of the village, which in traditional India, that mean, means at the edge of the forest. Most of the villages would be in forest clearings. <clears throat> so one day he's just outside his house and a man comes running up and says, I'm a merchant, I'm carrying gold and there's a gang behind me, coming up behind me. They want to kill me and take the money. Where can I hide? So the pious Brahmin told him, you just go in the forest there. A few minutes later, some men came running up and said, we're a gang of thieves, there's a merchant we're chasing, he's got gold, you want to kill him and take, take it? Do you know where he is? He said, yeah, he's over there. Mm -hmm. So they went there and killed him and took the money. And the Brahmin maintained his vow of never telling a lie. When he died, he went to hell. Because in that situation, even though he had taken a vow, and even though a Brahmin is meant to be truthful, the principle of protecting a person, an innocent person, is a more important principle. He didn't know. He thought this is the best thing to do. It means he wasn't really thinking very deeply. He thought, my vow, I have to uphold it. I have to keep my 
I have to show I'm truthful. Hmm. What's the solution then? How do we know? What do we do? We might do something wrong, think we're doing something right. The answer is what? Anyone got the answer? Krishna Tekila Chaishta. Everything we should do for Krishna's pleasure. Kaunte Apratijani Hiname Bhakta Pranasha. Even if a devotee circumstantially does something wrong, Krishna will protect it. If we're sincere to serve Krishna. Not that we use Krishna's protection or promise of protection as an excuse to misbehave. So if we're sincerely trying to serve Krishna, first of all we should know what Krishna wants. And still if we're faced with some situation, generally because devotees live in the society of devotees, we can consult other devotees. But we can never tell what's going to happen in future. Many times I'm asked for advice about this and that, but I don't know what's going to happen in the future. You may say, so, shall we do this? And we think, well, if we do this, it might happen like this, it might happen like that. You can't tell. You can't tell, actually. Uh, so one can only go on in good faith and pray for Krishna's mercy. And keep life simple. Try to avoid complications. Live simply. Live simply means uh, don't get into complex uh, political situations in Krishna consciousness also. Even, uh, I might seem to be the wrong person to say this, but we should uh, try to avoid institutional politics as far as possible. But if you have some responsibility or position in an institution, it's almost impossible not to be touched by it. But as far as possible, we keep our life simple means how we live, you know, in a very uh, simple, straightforward method of earning money or making our living, nothing very complex or difficult or time-consuming time or or something that uh, puts great mental strain on us, stresses us. Keep things simple. Keep plenty of time for chanting Hare Krishna. That will keep your consciousness pure. Don't be ambitious. I will become a great religious icon or whatever. Or I'll become the greatest Madanga player south of the Canadian border. <laughs> <laughs> a good Mananga players or whatever in, in the whole of Michigan I'll be known as the great Kirtanir or I'll be the greatest cook or I'll be the greatest mother or whatever whatever we do even in Krishna conscious Maya tries to make us become proud I'm the most simple <laughs> I'm the most pure <coughs> Hare Krishna. What's your question? Well, by the way, um, I went a bit off the topic. Now. But yeah. We have to, without establishing the reality of God and what he wants, then these questions will go on. And the whole world is under a tremendous attack from the forces of atheism. It's been, it's been the official dogma of the state, of the, of the educational system, you're forced to go to school and learn all this rubbish. Uh, actually, not everywhere. In Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka and India, there is in many ways the same culture, although Sri Lanka is predominantly Buddhist. But uh, in 1947, after India got political independence, then Prime Minister Nehru brought in a policy of atheistic secularism in which his idea was religion is useless, it spoiled everything. And uh, But in Sri Lanka, they didn't do that. 
the government policy up to the present time is to teach religion in the schools. I, I was the first time I went there, I was surprised. I, I had a school program and I asked all the children, so what, can anyone say the ten avatars of Vishnu? All their hands went up. In India, hardly one person in 100,000 knows, could even say. I don't know if all of you could say. But uh, they all knew. Why? Because they're taught in the school. So it, it does... Uh, we, can, we, we can see from this how the, the effect of teaching covered atheism, uh, indirect atheism, has had an effect. And guess what? America is better than Europe. I think America is better. America is better than Europe. At least the majority of people in this country believe in God still, isn't it? Is it? Still. In Europe, it's not like that. And then we have uh, covered atheism in the form of Buddhism. That's popular in America, right? Oh, I, start, I won't start talking about that now. <laughs> well, just just uh, just one little point is that this Dalai Lama, he's considered the representative of Buddhism. He's just the representative of one small sect of it. That's all. In Sri Lanka, they wouldn't give him the time of day. <laughs> <laughs> they, they think he's a deviant from original Buddhism, which he is. I mean... The, Original Buddhism is in Sri Lanka, and everything else which came after that—it's just—it's Buddhism itself is a bunch of mental speculation. But other forms of Buddhism came later, and it's speculation on top of speculation. <laughs> it's so to to think that he's the leader of the world's Buddhists—it's it's wrong. Actually. He's the, the leader of one relatively minor sect which has become prominent because he was kicked out of Tibet and he eventually uh, wandered all over the world. So, uh, yeah, he's a, he's a nice guy, right? Intelligent guy, but no God. He's, a, he's the epitome of being good without God, which is a contradiction. So this we should teach. As Srila Prabhupada writes in the beginning of his Srimad Bhagavatam preface. Let's have a look. There's a need of vigorous propaganda. Where is that? Is it in the preface or in the uh, Tadvarg Visago verse? Vigorous propaganda. Anyway, there's so much. Srila Prabhupada writes about this edition of Bhagavatam. Simply by a careful reading, one will know God perfectly well, so much so that the reader will be sufficiently educated to defend himself from the onslaught of atheists. Mm. Where's that vigorous propaganda? Let's see if I can find that. So-called, this is from a purport by Srila Prabhupada, so-called scientists, philosophers, religionists, and politicians should therefore conclude, now I read the sentence before that, nature is so strong that no one can overcome her stringent laws. So-called scientists, philosophers, religionists, and politicians should therefore conclude that they cannot offer facilities to the people in general. They should make vigorous propaganda to awaken the populace and raise them to the platform of Krishna consciousness. 
our humble attempt to propagate the Krishna consciousness movement all over the world is the only remedy that can bring about a peaceful and happy life. We can never be happy without the mercy of the Supreme Lord. If we keep displeasing our Supreme Father, we shall never be happy within this material world in either the upper or lower planetary system. Anything else? Yeah. In the earlier part of the class, you mentioned about uh, all these different arrangements being uh, people trying to avoid Krishna. And I like that phrasing because I find myself also trying to avoid Krishna. And even though I'm aspiring to be a devotee, I still am finding ways to not read the Bhagavatam and chant my rounds when I should go on high down, that type of thing. So, how can it's one of those how can I questions. Yes. How can I be sincere? How can I be humble? How can I be determined? This kind of question, a generic answer to all of them is to um, find that association. Where it, find the association of devotees in, in whom we see those qualities that we desire in, in whom such qualities are manifest. By their association, we'll become uh, affected. That's a generic answer. Otherwise, it's our own sincerity. But if we do follow this process of reading and chanting, then uh, naturally we become enlivened in Krishna consciousness. So, we should make a program to do so. Sadhana means daily practice, certain things we have to do every day. So if we do that, then we'll find day by day we become more and more enlivened. And if we don't, we'll find we're losing, <coughs> losing inspiration. It's like taking food. If you eat, you get strength. If you don't, you can go on for some time, but the body needs food for nourishment. Simple example to understand. So we need spiritual nourishment. Hare Krishna. And I was wondering, um, as you were mentioning that uh, when, you saw, when, you, when I meet people on the streets and they read about different scientific you know, discoveries, they have this sense of like hope that soon the science will be able to solve the problem. They have hope that scientists will be able to solve all the problems. Really? Really? People still think like that? At least at the university, I mean, that's what they do. Uh -huh. Aha. At the university, to, yeah? Two big universities. But that's mostly overseas students? Local it's, also? It has a very local population too. Oh. Well, my... Uh, what I seem to be more seeing is that many people lost faith in scientists. Maybe the next generation is coming back with a resurgence because of the uh, the pollution and the cheating of the pharmaceutical companies and uh, lack of faith in doctors because you know they're just out to get your money. So for very Lack of faith in in what goes on as science is manifested in all kinds of alternative medicines. Mm. But you're finding that the students here, they have great hope mm. that by science will solve all the problems. Well, we have to make vigorous propaganda. That it's... it's uh, it's actually a ridiculous idea. What if the scientists could get you to live forever in this world? 
You like that? The body is growing older and older and older, and 500 years old body. Does it work when you get an atomic bomb on your head and make you nuclear bomb proof? Is it really? And then you. Do people really, really want to live forever? They just think as long as we're here, we'll be happy. It's an incredibly foolish idea that science can solve all our problems. They're not happy now with all their science. On the material platform, probably the happiest people, if there are any left, are those living in the jungles who never heard of science or America or any such thing. One god brother of mine, Tejas Prabhu, he told me he went with the, uh, what's that called, the Peace Corps, United States Peace Corps, to India, even before Srila Prabhupada had come to the West. And he was in Andhra Pradesh, with some tribe. Although they'd been living their life for generations, he was supposed to go there and teach them how to live better. <laughs> so he taught them how to do farming and this and that. So they weren't just hunting and gathering. Uh, but they didn't know that they were tribals. They didn't know that they were in the state called Andhra Pradesh or that there is any such state or that there was a country called India. They didn't know that. They didn't need to know it. Now they need to know it. Now they have to become Maoist. They're probably all the same village. They're probably all Maoists now. Mao Zedong lives on in India. All the tribals in that whole area. It's up from the... Uh, the uh, That's in between... Uh, where would that be? Vijayanagaram and then, then west of that there are mountains and that whole belt goes all the way up to Orissa. Hmm? And yeah, that's way over, that's further west. Adilabad's Yeah, well, that's a huge area. That's a huge area. So that, is that in uh, Telangana, Adilabad, no? Yeah. So that whole area and it stretches up through the Everywhere, in, in, in just outside Bombay, where we have our farm, that uh, Talasari, that's a whole, it was until recently, a uh, Maoist area, pockets of them here and there. So they were living fairly peacefully and happily, but then someone discovered that in the forests there are all kinds of minerals, and they were kicked out of their tribal home and then someone, probably the Chinese government, financed them to have an insurgence and so on. So they're not happy. They were happy living like that. But it was living in ignorance. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you, man. Yesterday you were saying about uh, sports between two teams, and yeah. uh, one person is, you know, wanting to win one team, and another person wanting to win yeah, another yeah. one. Yeah. Um, what do you say to the idea of somebody to say, okay, I don't care who, which team wins, but I want to just see a good sport. Or that used to be the idea. You play you play a sport just for the sake. It used to be, even when I was a kid, growing up in England, that cricket, it was considered a gentleman's game, and it's the game that matters. And you try to win, but it doesn't really matter who wins. <laughs> and that's gone, isn't it? Now cricket's... Uh, body line. Hmm? Body line. Australia, England. Body line? Body line. Body line bowling. 
Or oh, they try to injure you, is it? They try to. Oh, they deliberately try to. One guy got killed in Australia, right, by a by an Indian bowler. Oh, was it? Anyway, some Australian cricketer got killed. He got the ball on his neck or something. Yeah. On the head. Even they have all these. Yeah, yeah. Helmet. He touched it at a certain state, certain place that immediately was there. I but see. It's like a Kung Fu point. <laughs> <laughs> Is it something, something like that? Yeah. You know the point, you can kill them. Right? Now they came up with another strap of. Metal. So there's another strap to cover <laughs> that point. It became so nice. It's, it's, a, it's a huge business. Oh. Gambling, scams, spot fixing. Because. Spot fixing, yeah. If you say in America about cricket, no one gives a damn. <laughs> you say in America about Sachin Tendulkar or Amitabh Bachchan. Of course, he's not in cricket. Amitabh Bachchan, but he's, just see, they're so important in their own countries. A few years ago, Shah Rukh Khan came to America and they grilled him, the immigration. He's a Muslim. He said, I got, you know, I got 200,000 fans waiting for me. I'm a film star. <laughs> Have you ever heard of him? <laughs> Such a big man in India, and here he's considered to be potential criminal. <laughs> Just see. What's the use? What's the point? Would you rather be Shah Rukh Khan or Bipin Bihari Das? Yeah? <laughs> With all your financial struggles chanting Hare Krishna much better much better it, it's, there's no comparison whatever difficulties we may have in life the opportunity to chant Hare Krishna it just over overrides everything else Oh, I'm just going to finish on that positive note. I just finish the point I was saying. How do you, like, what do you talk to the students? Oh, what do you say to them? I didn't answer that question. Give them the book, Life Comes from Life, if they'll take it. It's a good challenge. Very good points in there. Yeah. It's not that we're trying to convert everyone on the spot. Give them the books, let them read, let them consider. You can tell them also that, okay, science is very good, this, this, this. But there, there comes a point in everyone's life where they, where it, it's just natural. Everyone there comes to a point where people face difficulties and they, they look within and they wonder... Is there more to life than this? So take this book now, and that will help you at that time. It will come. Don't think that it's your whole life is just going to be some something like uh, out of a Disney <laughs> Cinderella. What's it? Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. It's not like that. Life isn't like that. It's going to be tough. Be realistic. It's already tough. You can tell the students. Life's already tough, isn't it? And they think it's tough, and they didn't even get out of university yet. You can even tell them, hence the sciences, to take away your stress that you face every day when you got Yeah, to yeah, that's a good line. They can tell them that. They're completely stressed out. They're, they're, they're and, uh, well, actually, they know, because as soon as they get out of college, they, they have to start paying off their $200,000 debt, right? That's their whole life. Their whole life, every moment of their life, Directly or indirectly, they, they have it in their head. I got this debt on my head. And if you manage to pay it off in your life and then you buy a house and you retire, you can't afford to pay the property tax on the house after you retire. It's all a big scam. Why do people believe in scientists and politicians? It's this country. They've just been looted by the bankers. You're working in a bank, isn't you? In Houston. Houston. In uh, Seattle, Radhika Gopina told me that our devotees wanted to get a little land for uh, growing food and living simply. 
but it's eleven thousand dollars tax on the land every year, which means they have to grow commercially to pay. And there's a beautiful stream runs right through. It. You're not allowed to touch the water. The water, you, you, it's government property. You can't take it. They make it impossible to live in a simple manner. Yeah. Okay. Well, we should end sweetly. Where's the sweets? <coughs> no sweets. Krishna's sweet. Madhuram, Madhuram. Hare Krishna. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna.